Welcome, everyone. My name is Ted O'Connell. I'm one of the authors of Crush Step 1, the ultimate USMLE Step 1 review. This is the second edition of the book, and we're going to go through it chapter by chapter. This is part one of the neurology chapter. We're going to start by talking about anatomy and physiology. Let's begin with neurohistology. The nervous system is composed of two general components, neurons or nerve cells, which are the functional units involved in nerve transmission, which occurs via a synapse, and glial cells, which are the supporting non-neuronal cells that serve different functions, such as modulating nerve transmissions at the synapse itse itself or myelinating nerves. Neurons. These are the non-dividing functional units of the nervous system, which can be classified according to function, motor, sensory, or interneurons. Each neuron is broken into a cell body, receiving dendrites, and a single projecting axon. Of the three components, clumps of rough endoplasmic reticulum, or RER, and polyribosomes, referred to as nissel bodies, are only found in the cell body and dendrites, and not in the axon. The dispersion of these Nissel bodies, which appear dark when using the Nissel stain, is a prominent feature in axonal injury and is appropriately termed chromatolysis. Glial cells. There are four central nervous system, or CNS, glial cell types. These are astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and ependymal cells. And there's also one peripheral nervous system glial cell type, Schwann cells. Astrocytes. These are the most abundant and largest of the glial subtypes. Although thought as support, they play a far greater role. Their most notable role is the metabolism and recycling of certain neurotransmitters, glutamate, serotonin, and gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. They also buffer the extracellular potassium concentration, respond to injury, gliosis, and make up the blood-brain barrier. They contain glial fibrillary acid, acidic protein, GFAP, which is a marker used in brain cancer such as astrocytoma and glioblastoma. Oligodendrocytes. These cells myelinate neurons within the CNS. One cell myelinates multiple neurons and are damaged in disease processes such as multiple sclerosis and leukodystrophies. Microglia. These cells arise from monocytes, their hematopoietic precursor, and thus are the resident macrophages of the CNS. Their function is to protect the CNS. When the brain is damaged or infected, they become activated and multiply quickly to perform functions such as phagocytosis and presenting antigen. Microglia cells are implicated in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer disease and Parkinson disease, as well as infections such as human immunodeficiency virus, HIV infection, where they form multinucleated giant cells. Appendymal cells. These ciliated cells line the cavities of the CNS, the, the ventricular system, in the choroid plexus, where they in, are involved in the production of CSF and are part of the blood CSF barrier. They are implicated in disease processes such as ependymomas and syringomyelia. Schwann cells. These cells are derived from neural crest origin and are similar to oligodendrocytes, but instead myelinate neurons in the peripheral nervous system. One cell myelinates one neuron. They are implicated in diseases such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, chronic inflammatory demyelating polyneuropathy, schwannomas, and acoustic neuromas, also known as vestibular schwannomas. Now let's move on to sensory receptors. Sensory neurons receive signals from external or internal stimuli via numerous sensory receptors. Each type of sensory receptor conveys a unique type of sense such as vibration, pressure, pain, and temperature. In addition to classifying receptors based on the sense they convey, we can also classify them according to location, morphology, and rate of adaptation to a stimulus. Slow adapting receptors, such as muscle fibers, Merkel discs, and Ruffini corpuscles, 
steadily detect the stimulus and steadily produce a signal over the duration of the stimulus. In contrast, fast adapting receptors, such as Meissner corpuscles and Pacinian corpuscles, quickly generate action potentials that diminish soon after the onset of the stimulus. This gives us a sense of the stimulus duration and intensity. This is why we stop feeling our clothes soon after we have them on. Cutaneous receptors. Let's start with free nerve endings. These are non-encapsulated nerve endings located throughout the epidermis and some viscera. They convey information regarding pain and temperature. Some of these nerve endings are associated with C fibers, which are slow, unmyelinated, convey warm temperature, and are involved in referred pain. Others are associated with A fibers, which are fast, myelinated, convey cold temperatures, and are involved in localized pain. Merkel discs. These are non-encapsulated, large, slow-adapting, myelinated fibers located in hair follicles. These convey the senses of position and static touch, such as textures. Pacinian corpuscles. These are encapsulated, large, fast-adapting myelinated fibers found in the dermis, ligaments, and joints. They convey the senses of vibration and deep pressure. Meissner corpuscles. These are encapsulated, large, fast-adapting myelinated fibers found in the epidermis of hairless or glabrous skin, such as the fingers and lips. These convey the senses of position and dynamic touch, such as light touch. Krauss end bulbs. These are primarily for the sensation of cold. Think Krauss sounds similar to Santa Claus, who is always cold in the North Pole. Ruffini corpuscles. These are encapsulated fibers, which adapt slowly, are found in the dermis, and convey the senses of pressure and skin stretch. Now let's turn to muscle receptors. The main sensory muscle receptors are spin muscle spindles, which detect change in the length of skeletal muscle fibers and Golgi tendon organs, which are placed at the junction of the tendon and muscle fibers and sense the force of contraction. Muscle spindles. The muscle spindles are present in intrafusal fibers, which run parallel to the actual contractile muscle fibers. The contractile muscle fibers are also referred to as extrafusal fibers. By running in parallel or along with the contraction of the muscle, intrafusal fibers can detect when the length of the muscle shortens or lengthens. This can be better understood with a clinical example, such as the myotactic reflex, in which hitting the patellar tendon with a reflex hammer causes the knee to jerk. The tendon is stretched with the hammer, pulling on the muscle spindle. This, send, this then sends information to the spinal cord, which stimulates the knee extensor muscles to contract, causing the knee to jerk. It also inhibits the knee flexor muscles from contracting. A quick way to remember which nerve roots are tested by which reflexes is simply to count to eight. The ankle is S1 and 2. The patella is L3 and 4. Biceps is C5 and 6 and triceps is C7 and 8. The Golgi tendon organ. This is located at the junction of muscle fibers with its tendons arranged perpendicular to extrafusal muscle fibers. This receptor conveys a sense of muscle tension via afferent nerves and provides an autogenic inhibition reflex, also called the inverse myotatic reflex, which causes muscle relaxation before a tendon can be torn. This is why weightlifters may drop a heavy weight before it's too late, and why the sensory receptor overrules the muscle spindle. Now let's talk about neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are substances found in synaptic vesicles that are secreted into the synaptic cleft from a presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron. They are classified according to chemical composition and the action elicited, which can be excitatory or inhibitory. Chapter 7 will provide additional details of synaptic transmission and metabolism of many of these neurotransmitters. Amino acids, beginning with glutamate. As part of the glutamatergic pathway, glutamate has an excitatory effect, specifically on N-methyl-D-aspartate, or NMDA receptors, 
and is involved in cognition functions such as learning and memory in the hippocampus. In brain injury or disease, such as a stroke or seizure, excitotoxicity from excess glutamate release can lead to neuronal damage and death from the resulting excess calcium influx into the neuron. Gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter found in the nucleus accumbens and is involved in regulating excitability throughout the nervous system. It is decreased in anxiety and Huntington disease. Glycine. This is an inhibitory neurotransmitter used by the Renshaw cells of the spinal cord. Strychnine, which can be fatal to humans, blocks its action. Acetylcholine. Found in the basal nucleus of Maynard. This neurotransmitter is involved in functions such as learning, short-term memory, arousal, and reward. In Alzheimer's disease, there's a loss of neurons in the nucleus of Maynard, and thus the amount of neurotransmitter released is reduced. Opioid peptides. These include endorphins, enkephalins, and dysnorphins, and they're involved in analgesia. Now let's talk about monoamines and catecholamines, beginning with dopamine. This neurotransmitter is involved in functions such as nausea, reward, cognition, the motor system, and the endocrine system through four discrete pathways. The nigrostriatal pathway is part of the motor system. It projects from the substantia nigra in the midbrain to the striatum. Destruction of these neurons can lead to Parkinsonism and extrapyramidal symptoms, which are, can be side effects of antipsychotic drugs. The mesolimbic pathway is found projecting from the ventral tegmentum in the midbrain to the nucleus accumbens. This is generally considered the reward pathway of the brain. It has also been linked to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, including hallucinations and delusions, which is the target for many antipsychotic drugs. The tubero infundibular pathway is found projecting from the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus to the portal vessels of the infundibulum. Dopamine in this case inhibits prolactin release in the anterior, anterior to pituitary. As a result, symptoms such as gynecomastia, galactorrhea, and menstrual dysfunction may result from dopamine blocking agents, including antipsychotic medications. The mesocortical pathway is found projecting from the arcuate nucleus to the frontal lobes. This has been linked to negative symptoms of schizophrenia causing the characteristic hypoactive flat affect. Neuro, norepinephrine is found in the locus, locus ceruleus, found in the pons, lateral tegmental areas, reticular formation, and solitary tracts. This neurotransmitter is involved in the arousal, reward, and maintenance of mood. In depression, norepinephrine is decreased. In states such as mania, anxiety, or stimulant drug use, such as amphetamines and cocaine, norepinephrine is elevated. Of note, in Alzheimer's disease, there's substantial loss of the locus ceruleus. Serotonin is found only in the raphe nucleus of the brain stem. This neurotransmitter is involved in functions such as mood, sleep, and pain. It is elevated during mania and reduced in depression, anxiety, and insomnia. Now let's move on to others. Adenosine generally acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Caffeine acts as a stimulant by anti antagonizing adenosine receptors. Of note, adenosine is used in the treatment of supraventricular tachycardia, especially in higher doses when it comes to patients drinking caffeine. Nitric oxide, formed from the conversion of arginine to citrulline, this neurotransmitter is involved in memory formation through paracrine signaling. Nitric oxide has been linked to reperfusion injury when blood flow is reestablished in an ischemic region. Substance P is an excitatory neurotransmitter involved in pain transmission. Now let's talk about cerebral perfusion pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure is a tight autoregulation of the net pressure causing brain perfusion. This net pressure, typically defined as CPP, is the difference between mean arterial pressure, or MAP, and intracranial pressure, the ICP. That is, CPP equals 
MAP minus ICP. With auto regulation between MAP and ICP, CPP is maintained between 50 and 150 millimeters of mercury. However, outside the limits of auto regulation, increased ICP, for example, in traumatic brain injury, cerebral edema from stroke or DKA, or vasogenic and cytotoxic edema, this leads to decreased CPP, which is de detrimental. To address this detriment, therapeutic hyperventilation is often used, where decreased partial pressure of CO2 results in cerebral vasoconstriction and decreased cerebral blood flow. ICP can also be relieved with measures such as administration of hypertonic saline or mannitol, or by dramatic measures such as craniotomy. That's the end of the section on neurohistology. In the next section, we will talk about anatomy.